So the title of the lesson in the book is The Mirror of Our Heart, The Words That We Speak. And this uh, lesson goes into a lot of the, uh, really what we say, how we communicate, um, the counsel that we receive and things like that. You know, I think it's uh, one of the most fascinating things about the Proverbs is that uh, each verse can stand alone many times itself. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, we sometimes uh, can get into a habit of breaking down verses to the point that they lose their meaning. And uh, I think we always have to be careful of that. But obviously context is always important when you're studying the Word of God. In the book of Proverbs, it's kind of, uh, like I said, each verse uh, sometimes will... will uh, feed off of the verse above it or uh, something like that, but many times they stand alone and these principles can be um, taken for what they are. Um, it starts off here and it says one of the most difficult things that we are called to do is to control what we say. There's a lot of passages in the Bible, uh, the, you know, Proverbs is full, full of them, Psalms, uh, are full of them, and even the New Testament is full of descriptions or uh, instructions in how we use our tongue. First um, Peter uh, three ten, in referencing a psalm, says, "He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit." Colossians four six says. Uh, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt, corrupt word proceed out of, the mouth, out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. It is universal, and the longer you live, the more that you have seen this. The battle that we have over our tongue and the uh, trouble that it can get us into is something that we've probably all experienced. Um, some people have experienced maybe more grief than others, but it's something that we all can relate to, and I think that that's why, uh, you know, this lesson is very important. It makes us think of these things. You know, it says here one of the most difficult things, as we said, uh, we are called to do is control what we say. I think that, you know, some people, like I said, may have a more difficult time with this. It doesn't come as naturally, but uh, why is it so difficult to control what we say. Why is that a battle that we are always fighting? Because that's some kind of self-serving. Okay. Usually, there is something that feeds into that. Maybe you don't know the root of it at the time and you can look at it later, but oftentimes, if you react out of anger, maybe you're not even angry at the person that you're reacting to, but you're angry because of something else. It's something you're thinking about. It says later in this, in this uh, uh, lesson, and we'll talk about it. The first requirement in proper communication is listening, the second is thinking, and the thirdly speaking. But we naturally have a difficult time uh, monitoring what we say sometimes. And a lot of that has to do with what we are surrounded by, what we are feeding in. Um, because it's just natural that what we are constantly uh, surrounding ourselves with, reading, watching, whatever it is, that's usually how we talk. It, is, it, <laughs> it never fails, and this is a side note, if I watch a show that's got very strong British accents, and it's, let's say, two hours long, there is a very good chance that within the next 30 minutes, everything that I say to Janae is going to be in a British accent. <laughs> because that's what I'm thinking about, those are the words that I heard, and, and, and you know, that's how I heard, and you know, whatever. That's just something in the, in, the, in the gist of what we take in, how we say it, that type of mindset. So when we're surrounding ourselves by people that speak awful or, or, or curse often or things like that, we may not even find ourselves realizing that that is something we are absorbing. So we have to be careful of that, obviously, of the things that we take in. You know, one of the few things about texting or text messaging, and I know that there are some that probably are here tonight that say, I don't do that texting, you know, that's for the young crowd. But one of the good things 
is that, at least for me, it has made me reread what I'm about to send before I send it. And maybe second guess myself, I didn't really word that, or I said that kind of angry, or whatever it is, I may delete it, and it may have saved both parties involved a lot of grief. Now, some people read it, and they're like, I don't care, and they send it anyway, and it may cause problems. But that is one thing, you know, when you type something out, when you write a letter to someone, and you're able to read it yourself, uh, maybe from their shoes or their perspective, it kind of changes things. Well, that's not always easy to do when you're talking one-on-one -on -one to someone. And so you have to be very mindful of what you say. And I think that that's what this lesson, uh, you know, goes into. Um, it says, uh, the overall purpose of this study is to gain insight into those things that are right before we do those things that are wrong. The control of the tongue begins with the preparation of the heart. Our heart, our words reflect what is in our heart. For out of the heart, the mouth speaks, which is, is uh, uh, taken from Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36. But here's what's important. To control what we say, we must control what we think. To control what we think, we must control what we put into our minds. So, and we spoke about this, you know, briefly. Have you ever caught yourself, uh, you know, I was trying to think of an example in which we talk about what's on our mind. And probably everyone here, whether you're working or you're retired or, or you had a job in a certain industry, whatever it is, especially if it's a very directed type of job, if you find someone else in that industry, it is like you, you it's like candy. You just want to talk, you use all the lingo and they understand. I, I feel the same way, you know, in my job. If I talk to someone else who's also a landman who does like oil and gas research or whatever it is, then instead of me trying to explain, okay, well an oil company will go in and they drill a well into the ground and I have to go and I do whatever. If I'm talking to someone that knows the industry, I'm like, hey, so how many wells do you have that are HBP? Are they, you know, producing, you know, is it, how many acres is it holding? What formation is it hitting? Whatever it is. And someone from the outside is not going to know anything I'm talking about. But I have that commonality with that person, whatever it is. That is something that we, as Christians, should share. No matter what differences that we have amongst ourselves, no matter how different our personalities are, there is something universal amongst all of us, and that is the Word of God. And so when that is on our mind, you talk about it. You can't help but talk about it. Whether it be a sermon you listen to, whether it be a passage you read, whatever it is, you want to talk to someone about it. And there is nothing more uh, uh, enjoying or, or nothing more that one can enjoy than talking to someone that has that common interest. And so I think that it's important to us, uh, important for us, to realize that what we put into our mind, whatever it is, is going to come out. It just happens that way. But it's important that we uh, control what we put into our minds. Does anybody have any comments? Absolutely. I, I think that, um, you know, I, whether it be a, an excuse or not, there's no justification for a Christian ever saying something that's inappropriate. It may be an excuse, hey, I didn't mean to say that or, or I shouldn't have said that. You still said it. And like, you know, Jeremiah said, that came from somewhere. It may be very deep rooted and you may not even realize or remember the source of it, but it got in there some way. I can't talk about something that I have no idea, 
you know, what it is. Think about a job or, some, you know, some type of uh, uh, industry that you don't know anything about. It's very rare that you're going to be able to talk about that with any type of intelligence. It's because I don't know it. I haven't learned it. I haven't read about it. But if there's other things that I have, then I say them, I know where it came from. So you have to be very careful, obviously, with what we put in. The first verse of, of Proverbs 15 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So, you know, I've heard before that uh, the opposite of love isn't hate. You know, we often think love and hate, and those are, you know, the opposites of one another, but it's actually indifference. Um, you know, even hate has some type of emotion, connection to that person. But if I'm indifferent towards you, uh, that's a lot more hurtful than if I hated you. I would think that most people, you know, think, well, if you hate me, at least maybe I can get you around to, to loving me again. But indifference is something. And so I think that this idea of a soft answer is something that it shows love towards that person, whatever uh, that may be. And, of course, a harsh word stirs up anger. Has anyone at any time in your life been either the culprit or the recipient of this scenario? Or I should say, has anybody not? I think that would be the only way I'd see any hands. But the, the idea that when we communicate to one another, whoever it is, whether it be father, son, mother, daughter, brothers, uh, friends, family, our, our church family here, this is a principle that is universal. It should be on our mind that a soft answer goes a long way and it, it uh, can turn away wrath. It says uh, in, the, in the book, proper disposition and doctrine make the difference. What does, in your own words, uh, disposition mean? How would you define it? If you were to, if I was just to ask you about Webster's or whatever, but how would you... Describe disposition, someone's disposition. The way they are. The way they are, okay. How, how you carry yourself. Okay. How you're inclined to act. Okay, yeah. You know, it's, uh, I think it's someone's inherent qualities that they, are, they portray, like you all said, in their life. Um, you know, I always, when I hear disposition, I always think of the phrase sunny disposition, you know, whether or not that's been used as an example, not towards me necessarily, but someone says, well, you know, so-and-so has a very sunny disposition and they're always, you know, happy. They're always gleeful. They're, you know, just, uh, uh, they just have this aura about themselves in which they, you know, make others want to be around them. But our disposition is it's deeper than this surface type of smile. You know, it's, it's based on truth and it's based on, uh, you know, God's word. But we have to have the proper disposition. And that way, when those occasions occur in which someone is angry towards us or whatever, the things that we say, the words that we say are proper.
Yeah. I have no idea how she stated to us. No, I understand. You know, uh, sometimes I think it can backfire, you know, on some when their reputation is not a soft answer. It almost seems sarcastic yeah. if it's not, uh, you know, if, if someone's known for being very loud, very boisterous, very uh, argumentative, and they all of a sudden say, I think you're right, then it's going to be, ta okay, what's going on here? Uh, that doesn't mean you don't do it and you just continue on, but it's something I think that you kind of have to, uh, uh, you have to practice and you definitely have to put into your life on a more consistent basis. Uh, the first question in the, in the book, and we've got a lot of questions here, three questions to go over. How should we respond to someone who is angry with us? Okay, soft answer, we said it. Um, do we react the same whether or not that anger is justified or unjustified? In other words, if someone's angry at me because I did them wrong and I show this soft answer, you know, that's what I should do and that's proper and I tell them I'm sorry or whatever. However, if they're angry at me and I didn't do anything wrong and you fill in the blank, do we think, you know, I know we know the answer. No, we still do a soft answer. What's the reality? What do we often do? Yeah, we get defensive. We try to tell them, no, 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 you don't have any right to be angry with me. Let me tell you why. And you go on this, you know, rampage about whatever it is. And it may be that they're misunderstood. They didn't understand the situation. They heard or whatever it is. They don't know. But you have created this chaos where you could have very, you know, softly said, I... I understand you're angry. I'm sorry. I did not do what you think I did. I didn't say what you think I said, whatever it is, and it could be remedied. But we often get defensive, especially if it's unjustified. And I think the reason is, is because so often it is justified. And so those moments in life in which it's not, we feel like we need to stand up for ourselves, especially when we live in a world that is constantly telling us to stand up for yourself. Yeah. Was, uh, um, this world looks at kindness as weakness often and in reality it's strength it's strategic it's on purpose and uh part of it the norm is to fly off the handle or think you can uh think you've been railroaded or whatever right. you know yeah thanks well it's whether uh, there's cause for anger towards you somebody's angry, typically they're not rash. And there's no way you can present somebody with something that has to do with God, something God leads, if, if they're angry or if you're fueling that fire, you know, right back, you're not going to have any opportunity whatsoever to impart anything of Jehovah to them. Nothing. So, you know, I, I'm guilty as all that I have not always kept my, my temper, you know, when, in conversation. But uh, I, I noticed after I became a Christian that if I do use it in a calm manner, it, it just goes a lot further. And even with worldly things or whatever, it doesn't matter. But I just noticed you definitely don't ever have a chance again, typically, if you're trying to teach somebody the gospel you even react towards them. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, and it says here um, in the second verse, or the second part, a harsh word stirs up anger. Kind of what you said, one of the things that you often lose, and, and many of you probably have experienced this, in the heat of a very angry argument, whatever it is, is logic often goes out the window. If the two people that are arguing uh, are so caught up in the moment of trying to win the argument that they forget about logic in general, of even understanding why they're arguing. It's just a matter of winning at that point, whatever it is. It's kind of like, you know, uh, it's we say it almost in a comical way, but you get to the end of a very long fight, and you say, well, I don't even remember why we were fighting. 
whatever it is. And so, you know, I think that you can really de-escalate any situation by uh, b being calm and, um, you know, having a soft answer towards something. DJ? You know, it, um, it says there we must learn to approach every situation with the proper uh, temperament. Have you found yourself uh, having a different disposition or way of thinking in those moments in which you are, and when I say caught off guard, I mean maybe an unexpected conversation compared to one that you have a plan for meeting? Let's say you're wanting to preach to someone about the gospel. Let's say it's about an issue uh, between two people, and you, you've been thinking about it a lot, or, or, or uh, maybe you haven't, maybe you didn't even know about it, and they just walk right up to you and they confront you, you know, with this issue, this problem. And we find ourselves, uh, you, know, uh, you know, kind of stumbling over words, we didn't really know what to say, we may say something, and we have to say, well, I didn't, I didn't mean that, I just meant, you know, this, or, or whatever it is. But if I said, hey, I want to visit with you about this in, in a week, Let's meet on this time. Then for a week, I'm going to be thinking about that. And the words that I say are going to be a little more thought out. Have you ever surprised yourself in a good way when the subject of the gospel, of, of Jesus, of the Bible, of whatever it is, comes up in a situation and you're almost able to spout out uh, information and facts and you're kind of catching yourself halfway and you're thinking, Man, I'm doing pretty good, you know, whatever it is. It, uh, you know, uh, have you ever caught yourself doing, doing that? And if you haven't, you know, I would say that um, I hope that you can. Um, a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, how much you read and how much you learn and how much you uh, absorb. But going into the second verse, uh, you know, Jeremiah kind of talked about it. But it says that, um, you know, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of the foolish or for, fools pours Fourth foolishness, tongue twister. I think, you know, it's interesting that it says the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, which means that knowledge can be used, kind of what Jeremiah said, wrongly. Um, there are people, and we all know them, uh, that are extremely intelligent, that have knowledge that is beyond what many of us may ever understand or know. Maybe it's their way of thinking, whatever it is, they have a great mind for soaking up knowledge. There are professors, doctors, whatever it is, um, that have an amazing knowledge, 
of the words in the Bible, but they don't use it rightly. And it, and it can, uh, what's sad, so sad about that is that it can cause so many people to be led astray because it is based on something that is true, but it's used falsely or used wrongly. And people don't know the difference because they don't study it themselves or they don't know enough and they can be led astray. So obviously using uh, knowledge is something, you know, that's imperative for a Christian. It's not everything, um, you know. It's funny that he brought up the word tact because that's kind of uh, what I had written down. We often say, or I guess I, I shouldn't say we often say, I've heard it said that it doesn't really matter how you preach the gospel as long as it's, for, as lo as long as it's taught. Well, <laughs> I think that that has a caveat to say, okay, well, are you, what do you mean when you say are you teaching the gospel? If I'm reading the word of God, it's really hard to mess that up if I'm just reading it word for word. But if I'm preaching it in a way that takes away from the word of God, then I'm not really truly teaching the gospel. And so I think that there's a great uh, importance put on the tact that we have when discussing the gospel to people. And a lot of that comes from the wisdom of having done it wrong maybe multiple times. And you start to read a person and you start to understand where they come from. You know, it, 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 in other words, maybe the first time that you study with someone who is uh, lost or, or in a condition, um, you know, fallen away, and you're trying to teach them the gospel and they want to tell you, well, this is where I'm coming from. You're like, no, 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 no. Just listen to me. You're going to turn off an ability for them to be able to express so that you may be able to get something to help aid you in your teaching. We have to be able to listen. Yeah, Scott. If you're a preacher or a teacher, a Christian, uh, keep and the word is the word and the truth is the truth. But are you preaching, teaching, or talking to somebody in a manner of here's the truth, and if you don't believe me, you're an idiot, or are you teaching to them here's the truth? And I'm telling you this because I'm very, I'm, I'm, I want your soul, you know, I'm concerned for your soul or I'm trying to teach you the truth because I love you. You know, which one are you? I mean, right. Sometimes you're different people, but, you know, you've heard the ones that are just up there preaching yeah. more or less, if, you know, angry, you know, the whole time. I think, you know, what we have to obviously be very careful of is that. Even if someone preaches the truth in the wrong way, it doesn't give any justification for the person not obeying the truth. And I say that in the sense that they can certainly harm the truth being taught. But if someone has a Bible in front of them and someone is preaching to them and they're doing it in the wrong way, I don't close my Bible and say, all right, you had your chance. I can stand justified because this person did it in the wrong way. I still have a responsibility. Each one of us do. No matter how bad the person does in teaching me the gospel, we have a responsibility to learn it ourselves. I think that you can be uh, more helpful to the cause of Christ when you teach the gospel in a way that is out of love, the way that God has told us to do it, because you love their soul and not because you're angry at them or because you want them to get better because you're mad or whatever it is. You do it out of love. And when you do it out of love, they see it. I don't think that there's anyone here that has lived, you know, very long at all that can't think back on moments in which they were even corrected, but it was done out of love that they don't appreciate. Because that is often, that comes across um, when we talk to people. And we have to remember that when we talk to other people. Yeah, uh, the excuse of I'm offended is never an excuse for not obeying the gospel. Um, you know, whether or not they get offended obviously can't be the, the variable. So it says if we find our relationships with others burdened by constant argument, we need to examine and alter our manner of communication. 
You know, I know that um, I think there are some people <laughs> that uh, almost, uh, you could almost describe them as they just like to argue for argue's sake. Uh, they kind of have a, a manner about them in which whatever it is, however small it might be, they like to argue about things. Um, when you're confronting this person, sometimes they don't even realize it. They just think that everybody that they talk to is arguing with them all the time. You know, I'm not an argumentative person. It just seems like everybody wants to argue with me. Well, I think that there's a common denominator, and it's not everybody that you've ever met. It's usually yourself. And so, you know, oftentimes if you find yourself, I'm always arguing with people, it may not be the other people that are always wanting to argue. There's a time and a place for, uh, you know, when I say argument, I don't mean in the heat or anger or anything like that, in which, you know, uh, a debate can be done. I think that, I, side note, I wish we had more debates like we used to. And when I say we used to, I never saw one live. I've just read books. But, uh, you know, I've heard about, uh, you know, debates and how compelling they, they are for an audience to see two sides of an argument uh, or an issue um, discuss, you know, in a proper spirit why they believe a certain thing and the truth will come out, you know, and you can believe it or not. Um, you know, it says proper communication brings a cheerful countenance, uh, calms contentions, and joyful living. Other elements necessary in our communication with others are truth and righteousness. The basis for all truth is founded upon God's word. Therefore, before we can effectively communicate, we must study. The first requirement in proper communication is listening. I think that this is an attribute, and I would say, I used to say there's some people that are just naturally very good listeners. And I think that that's a disservice to very good listeners. I think that there are people that have learned over a lifetime, maybe over bad experiences, whatever it is. I've said whatever it is, I don't know, a thousand times now. They have, they have trained themselves to be good listeners. There are also very good nodders. And when I say a good nodder, it means that I'm doing this, but all I'm thinking about is hoping that you finish whatever you're saying, because i got something that I need to tell you. And we've all been there. Maybe we've been whatever side you may have been on. And, uh, you know, I, I was hoping that, you know, Janae was going to teach a kids Bible class or something because I find myself being a nodder and it's not necessarily that I'm nodding because I want to say something it's just because there's a lot to listen to <laughs> and uh, you know sometimes and, and I say that obviously in a comical sense but when we're studying with someone when we're talking to them about the gospel it is imperative for us to listen to where they're where they're coming from if I talk to someone about the work of the church and I go into the elders and I go into evangelism and, and benevolence and all this stuff, and then when I get done on my 45-minute sermon, they say, I actually don't even believe the Bible is inspired. And I'm like, I wish we could have discussed this at the beginning. It's important for us to listen. We have to understand that. So, and then, of course, uh, you know, the second is th uh, thinking and thirdly speaking. Some people... You know, skip two altogether. Um, some people take too long on two. Uh, you know, there are, there are times in which something needs to be said uh, at certain times, and we think, well, now is not the time. We just we need to be patient. And what happens is that moment's passed. You didn't say something when you should have said something. And now if you said something, it, it would be, you know, misunderstood. So, um you know, too often it says we speak before we think. This leads to many foolish, damaging things that bring regret and grief. I think we all have experienced that um, on one side or the other. Uh, something being said in the heat of a moment that can cause, you know, uh, wounds that are very deep. I think that that is, uh, you know, the Bible talks about it. Like we said, James has a lot to say about the tongue also. But... Sometimes I think that we forget how powerful the words that we say are um, and how damaging they can be to our friends and family um, or our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Um, not to mention the words that are said, and this isn't even going into the words that are said behind their back. Um, gossiping and things like that is another um, obvious problem with the tongue. But we have to be mindful always of the things that we say and, and how we say them. Does anybody have any comments? Yes. Just a, just a fast one. This, this whole lesson reminds me of firearms training for two things. One is that whether it's done quickly or whether it's done by calculation, you're responsible for every bullet that leaves your gun and where it hits. And it's the same way with speaking. If, if you are unpracticed, uh, prone to anger, and irresponsible with the words that you say, they can hurt not only the person that you're talking to, but people in the surrounding area, people that you didn't even know were listening. So you have to be trained, you have to train yourself, not only what to say and when to say it and whom to say it to, but to make sure that those are targeted properly, uh, and that takes practice. Yeah, we, uh, we see, um, you know, there's a thousand cases, if not more, of people that have been caught saying something they shouldn't have because it's either been videoed or recorded or, uh, you know, something in which they didn't know that it was happening, and then they're, const you know, living the next few months of their lives trying to, you know, bring that back in. You know, we've seen that, that a comic of someone saying something and wishing you could just you know put the words back in but once you say something not only can it damage them uh, more importantly it can it can severely damage the gospel um, if you're standing to be a Christian um, you know it's something that can be very harmful to the truth yeah. in, in all this tongue speak we need to think about what's our motives is our motive self for what we want to say, what we want to portray, or are we trying to win souls? What is our reaction to a situation? Is it trying to win a soul? Or is it trying to win an argument? And and I think that comes the self is a hard thing to control, as well as the tongue you mentioned. But you know something to think about if you get yourself in situations. Why am I not thinking before I'm speaking, or, or whatever the case is there? Yeah, and I you know this lesson there's we. Uh, we, we have to be mindful even when talking about things that ha don't have to do with the gospel of what we say. So this lesson's almost twofold. When we're speaking about the things of God, the word of God, or we're teaching or, or preaching or whatever it is, we have to be very mindful of um, you know, how we say certain things. But in the same way, we have to be very mindful of everything that we say, what, whether it be uh, something that's secular or something that has to do with our job. We have to be mindful of it. Um, yeah. So what you do is you've done all of those things and you start to change them and pick something that doesn't contradict the other person who you said these things to holds on. Well, that's not on you. I mean, it, that's on... No, and I don't think, yeah, I, I think that, you know, if you have the proper spirit of repentance and you've went to them and, and tried to make it right, there are going to be consequences that no matter how much we might repent, we're, we might have to live with. And, you know, I often think about those people that have done something against the law and are put in prison and, you know, repent and, and ask God for forgiveness and make it right, but they still have to spend the rest of their life in prison. There are going to be earthly consequences to earthly decisions that we, or you know, to decisions that we do on earth. Um, and so, even though that your heart can, you know, stand before God justified because you've tried to make that right, it's on that person, um, you know, to forgive you and to, you know, uh, make it right with you because. That's all we can do. And, and if they don't, then that's a battle that we're going to have to face the rest of our life. You know, we, we've done that damage. We know that we're, we're acknowledging that we've caused that harm. Whatever we might have said, that's the, that's the penalty for it. And, you know, it's very sad to say because there are some people that have made it right 
and they're, there's a division for the rest of their lives um, because of it. Anything else? We'll go ahead and stop. Yeah, go ahead. Just, just real fast, I, I picked something up um, from my father, uh, actually, that was good. He taught me when I was young. <laughs> Not everything he told me was great. But this one, he always said, uh, be the first one to say I'm sorry. And if you follow that up with but, you've negated everything that you tried to say. You know, try to find out why the person is angry. Try to be the first one to say, I didn't mean that. Not just, I didn't mean that, you're wrong. I didn't mean that, I'm sorry. And you'll find that that, that soft word will diffuse a lot of people who are not normally you know, angry people. Okay, we'll finish this up and get into more of the Proverbs. I know we didn't get into a whole lot, um, but we'll do that on Sunday, Lord willing.